speaking, the time that we sit quietly or even sit and talk with each other before the meeting. We're going to have to develop an intensity, a passion, a deep desire, and a deep, deep pleasure, fun, excitement in the right way to rescue myself every minute. And we're going to find out how to do it tonight, a very practical way, but I have to do it. You understand? Being very watchful every minute. Right now as you're sitting here, right now as I'm sitting here, I'm watching myself talk to you. We're going to talk about tonight, we're going to learn to develop a way of thinking. Now, there's many ways I can rescue myself. Tonight, we're going to learn a way to rescue myself by using my mind correctly. How many times have we said before, while it's profitable and good and necessary to talk about advanced truth, high truths, to talk about oneness, subject like that, it's also essential to get right back to the basics. The basic tonight being learning to use my mind correctly so that I can indeed rescue myself all day long. You'll be able to develop your cosmic talent, so to speak, to rescue yourself a hundred times a day, 150 times a day. And when you do, you'll be the most astonished man or woman to see that you failed to do that all your life. Because suddenly now you have something to rightfully, rightly compare your day with, comparing it to the day when we were asleep, when we were angry, when we were nervous, when we were all caught up in our mad thoughts. going to break it. How are we going to do it? See, there's a phrase that beauty is simplicity, right? This is a beautiful thing we're going to do tonight. And so simple. Don't say because it's simple you already do this. You don't do it. You, you, if you catch one vague glimpse of what we're talking about tonight and put it into operation tonight, I congratulate you. With that, here's what we're going to learn to do. We're going to learn to think all day long and all night long in short, clear, guiding, accurate, good, helpful, intelligent sentences. We're going to think in sentences all day long that are short, that are clear, that are right and if I do that immediately I will cut off the racing off there the feeling that goes off into there the regret the sorrow whatever it might be see if I can think with feeling not mechanically then I just quote it which most of us do most of the time. It's easy to quote anything that has been said in this class. If I can think in a short sentence and do it because I sense, because I sense this can change my very nature as a human being here on earth, if I can do it with the feeling, it will indeed change me. But look, I do have to take the first step which is to interrupt myself a hundred times a day and instead of going along, instead of being carried away and kidnapped like the prodigal son, instead of wandering off into negativity, into negative thought, into vagabond thought, which we discussed, I can instead catch it, catch the state and replace it instantly with one right thought. And we're going to have lots of examples of these tonight. 
one right thought. When I think rightly to begin with, I then, I then have the opportunity to think right as a second thought. Don't take this as too simple. Don't say you understand this. You don't. Your, the expressions on your face would be different if you understood. No. If I think one right thought, and we'll have examples later, so don't be impatient about that. If I can think one right thought, something in me will affirm that it's right. That, that is strength to start the chain, it's all right, start the chain of a second right thought. That second right thought will also be felt by me. Now I have twice the strength to do what? To think the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. So instead of walking out of that office where the boss had a talk with me, or out of the home where I had the a disagreement with that family member instead of walking out of that room or out of that house muttering to myself my head down depressed and angry I walk out of there working I work in, walk out of there deliberately putting myself in a state which is different from what I usually do which begins to change me You examine your mental behavior all day, all day today, and now you're going to have to ask yourself a question. I'm asking you it, but you ask it to yourself. What were you telling yourself all day long? Right? What were you telling yourself all day? The trouble is, in giving a talk like this, or having a class like this, you may well assume this doesn't apply to you, that you had a, an average day, that you were in command of yourself all day long, or at least most of the day, and maybe indeed you did not have an exterior challenge which called out the worst in you. And maybe you have so cleverly covered up your state so that when there's no external challenge to your rights, to your egotism, to your demands, when there is no challenge, you think you're living in peace, that you have it made. And you just pray that the next day will be as, quote, peaceful as today. It won't be. And the reason it won't be is because you are still a slave of anything negative outside of yourself or inside of yourself. All right, let's start all over again so we don't miss <coughs> this tremendous lesson, this tremendous project we can do all day long. All day long and all night long, I'm going to begin of my own initiative, of my own effort, regardless of what the other people in the family are doing or what happens in that office. I'm going to find a situation where I can tell myself one single solid right thought and I'm going to watch myself telling that to me. I'm going to do that a hundred times a day. I might, I might do it two hundred times a day. Two hundred sentences, three hundred. <sighs> Which establishes the foundation. So you want to live in a beautiful castle with 20 stories to it, if castles have that many stories. And you want to go up to the top floor and be spiritual and look out and see the beautiful landscape out there. <coughs> and you'd be delighted to do it if someone else has done the work of building the foundation and putting the steps, you know the steps, the steps that go up from the foundation. You're not going to build it or be up on that 20th floor of the castle until you personally, by your own initiative, by your own effort, have built the foundation for yourself 
And tonight up until this point, you've heard a marvelous foundation. And if you do that, if you do that, you will know when you're ready for the first, second floor, second floor, and the third floor. So that all day long, instead of listening to my own madness, my own conditioning, my own imagination, my own unconscious naggings. Have you ever noticed how you nag yourself all day long? Huh? You nag yourself all day long? No wonder it tires you out. <clears throat> Instead of submitting to that, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to something beautiful, which is a right thought, a right idea. And when I do that, you will see how to do it with feeling a little later. When I do that, I will sense it's right. Then when I see the expression on the face of the boss or the relative or the man in the market, I do not unconsciously react, unconsciously react to it as I have been doing all my life and turn into a negative stream which lasts for 10 minutes. Uh -huh. Or I never react any lo I do not react any longer to my own negative wrong statements. For example, why is the world the way it is? You know the answer to that, do you not? Do you know why the world is the way it is? Because you is the way you is. <laughs> All the months that you have been coming to these meetings, you've been taking notes either on paper or mentally, you have all this marvelous, true, right, accurate knowledge stored up inside your mind. You're now going to make a deliberate, conscious effort to use it in the way which has been outlined up until now. You're going to remember to, your, to rescue yourself by putting a right thought right at the moment that crisis happens. Right at the moment you wonder whether you can ever make this or not. That's one of the most ridiculous thoughts you could ever think, whether you're going to make it or not. It's one of the greatest hoaxes that you're under, is to ask yourself whether you can make it or not. The answer being in brief, you can't make it at all, and neither can I. This is why we fail. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we're still neurotic. Because we haven't seen the accurate thought that I can't change myself at all. I can't do a thing for myself. If I tell myself that right thought, if I say to myself, I, comma, my old nature can't change anything and see the full significance of it, something happens. I, as thought, no longer cease to try to change myself and I change. Really, not in imagination. Is the idea relatively clear to you now of what we're going to do? I'm going to do this. I've been doing it. I'll, I'll even increase my intensity on it. I'll do it during the break. Will you do it during the break with me? Let's, we'll talk to each other about cookies and coffee. But at the same time, we're going to catch ourselves maybe in a false gesture. And we're going to put a, a right thought in its place after having caught ourselves. The right thought, simple. The right thought is, I made a mechanical, unconscious, false gesture. That is a right thought, isn't it? I'm not condemning myself for it. I made a plain statement which will make me aware of myself in action. And that awareness will put an end to false gestures, false facial expression, false feelings, unnecessary feelings. Okay. I will now give you, as they come to me, examples. You've already have, you already have a thousand from the notes. But think with me. We can think aloud during the break, we won't go into it now. You can give exa your own examples after the break. Right thoughts can be 
of, of an astonishing variety. Some, some can, seem, can seem to be insulting to me. Others can seem to be inspiring. Others can be a sledgehammer. Others can be exciting. Okay. So don't be afraid to, to see one of one kind and another of another kind. Right statement which I can give to myself anytime. When I lack the intelligence to try to understand something, I can cover it up with criticism. When I lack the intelligence to try to understand something, I can cover it up with criticism. Right? Ever do that? No? Huh? Boy, isn't it, isn't it a, a lot more exciting to criticize than to work hard to try to understand why I felt that way toward that person? And by the way, the reason I felt that way is because I felt uh, as if he was stealing something from me, or society was stealing something from me, which was a wrong feeling. Awareness of weakness, awareness of weakness will make it possible for a new kind of strength that is not my own to enter. Strength that is not my own to enter. <coughs> Hold the, if you want to discuss, catch it later. That's a girl. It is not necessary for me to pretend to understand. The closer I live with reality, the more I acquire an authentic sense of humor, which, by the way, is a subject we've never discussed, and maybe we will during the break. Who, who wrote that down so it's, it's exact? Go ahead, Leland. The closer I live with reality, the more I acquire an authentic sense of humor. Huh. We'll discuss this later after the break, but we're going to go into more now. Just, just quietly. I'm just thinking with you here. I must increase my personal initiative a hundredfold towards self-awakening. That's enough to give you the example of what. Look, I'm going to do this all day long. In the first place, it's going to give me a jolt because I love to complain, right? I don't put it on my face or tell the boss because he might fire me, but I love to complain. So this is going to be a jolt to my whole system to say, Neurotic complaint destroys me. Look how simple I can put it. And all complaint is neurotic because it's egotistical and self-centered. And it says, you shouldn't treat me like that. Which means you're under the illusion that there is a you and a me, which there isn't. You have the idea. Now, something very very important to add to this and please write it down in one way or another so that you have it to connect with everything we've had up until now <clears throat> when I collect spiritual facts when I collect spiritual facts Without, out, without also erasing egotism, 
when I collect spiritual facts without also erasing egotism, I live in imaginary spirituality. I live in imaginary spirituality. Now put a dash after that, you know, long dash. And frustration. This is what normal, what we call normal, average, everyday religion does and psychology does. It feeds us with an enormous amount of facts <coughs> which may, in many cases, be right on the level of knowledge, on the level of facts. Certainly it's right that I have to have self-knowledge. Everybody knows that. Any first grade psychology student will tell you that. Certainly I have to stop accusing you of having the faults th that I don't see in myself. Everybody knows that. We know those facts. If I collect facts without erasing egotism through seeing it as egotism, you know what happens, don't you? Then I do indeed become the preacher or I live in silent, secret dreamland of being spiritual and that God is watching over me. And I've unfortunately fallen into one of the most, the deepest, most difficult traps, pits, let's call it a pit, the deepest spiritual pits that any human being can ever fall into and one of the most difficult, most arduous to get out of once I've got down into it, because when I'm doubt, dark, down into it, my suffering is so secret and so intense and so un unbearable that I've lost all ability to, to look in any direction but in my, inside myself and then to lie and call this darkness light. I said, when I fall into this pit of collecting all these facts, without at the same time dying to my self-images, to my egotism, the pain, the fear of hell, the fear of God becomes so painful, so awful. The only escape I know, which is a false escape, is to call my darkness light. And I can behave like an animal with a psychopathic look on my face, and I can join with 10,000 other psychopaths with mad looks on their face and call each other spiritual. Along with reminding myself to rescue myself all day long, I must see that one of the right facts is not to attribute credit to myself for doing a thing. Not to say, I'm get now getting more spiritual. You don't have to say it. I don't have to say that. I get spiritual when I don't have the word spiritual in my mind at all. Because there's no one there to get spiritual. And there's no worry there's no concern, when I see this, when I understand this totally, fully, then there's no concern at all over my progress. The final objective is for me to first have a true thought, and this takes a lot of work because how many human beings and how many human beings in this room are listening to this tape know the difference between a right thought and a false thought. Let's see your hands. How many know the difference between a, a right thought and a false thought? Uh, for those of you listening to the tape, we have just one man in the room who knows the difference. When I really know a right thought, there is no me who knows it. There is just the right thought which is truth with a capital T. So where is the room for vanity 
for me feeling now I'm getting spiritual or more spiritual than you? Where is the necessity for me saying I have mental health and therefore I can help you have mental health? One sign of mental health is when I cease to try to save the world from its lack of mental health. All right, we'll continue with this after the break. The excitement of finding myself is the only excitement that never swings over to depression. How is that for a reminding, rescuing sentence? Now, all right, now listen. Listen, please. We're in open discussion, fine. When you speak, speak up loud and clear so that everyone can hear, so that I can hear you. Yes, Lillian. You said in the beginning, all night long also. Would you please go into that? Sure. How many of you do work during the night? I'm talking about when you, you know, you're going to bed at night. How many of you go to bed at night? That's when you can work. It's when your thoughts uh, start to take on a different character, maybe you find. Do you find that? Or don't you watch them at all? What are you laughing about? Huh? Going round and round. Al, what? Going round and round. Your thoughts go round and round. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because during the day, when you had that problem, your thoughts went round and round, but you never noticed it. Because immediately you shifted to another area of it going round and round, so you never notice any of them. Temporarily at night, you're going off to sleep, you notice the, the round and round because the, all the distractions are gone. And you begin to see it a little bit. We're, we crowd our minds so that we don't have one second of silence. And how many times have we said before, one of the things we're aiming for, right in the middle of that madhouse of an office or street, or family, if you live in a madhouse family, is to be able to find one second of silence inside myself. In that one second of silence, I have the opportunity to begin and say to myself, remind myself, to rescue myself with that one short, clear, concise sentence. That's my, how can I do it when I'm, my mind is raging? Don't you ever be depressed over thinking what this, these teachings, what this life might take away from you? Do you know you have those feelings, by the way? Yeah. You're, you're not quite, you know, huh? huh? I don't know. I don't know if I want to give that up or not. Now look, may I say you don't know the difference between right and wrong? So don't you dare decide what you're going to give up and what you're not going to give up. Or some of you ladies will give up lipstick and mascara and henna dye and then think you're spiritual. Did I get those right? Huh? I heard them somewhere. And I think there was a Marcel somewhere. <laughs> you ever known spiritual people who dress a certain way to tell you they're spiritual? They have made a judgment. You make no judgments at all as to what is right and wrong because you can't know on the level of thought alone. Only God knows the difference. That's right. That's serious. Only God knows the difference between right and wrong. I don't. My old nature doesn't. If it did, I wouldn't be the mess I am today and you wouldn't be the mess you are today. Raging all day long, Leland. Right? if we knew the difference between right and wrong and and could live it to know it is nothing anybody can know it in one sense you try living it today today when i get up now yesterday i lost my temper 10 times 
Today, I'm going to be peaceful and calm. Nobody's going to get my goat today. They'll get your goat today. Because you can't live what you know. Because you are trying to live what you know. When you cease to live what you know, you will live it. There will be living instead of you living. Which is one stream, one stream of life. Then when Juan and I talk, whether we talk about business or this home, whatever we talk about, there's one stream between us. Even if we talk about books, there's no division. Because he's not writing a book, and I'm not writing a book, and he wants his book to sell better than my book, and vice versa. How many of you understand, excuse me, how many of you understand the phrase ego competition? Understand what that means? How many of you have been in ego competition today? Is there anyone in the room who has not been in ego competition? One man. I don't understand what... All right. What is ego competition? Let's, let's uh, clear this up. Once, uh, all right, Al, yes. Uh, when, you attack, when you identify with it, or have a me or I, whatever you want to call it there, uh, that's your ego. Right. Identification. I have to win is egotism. Anything. I have to be wittier than you at the party. Anything. Haven't you, any of you, have, any of you in your life, any of you listening to this tape, what a question. Have you ever argued with anyone? Huh? The argument was ego competition. Uh, do we have to go into it anymore? Why do I need to win the argument? Why do I need to in enter into an internal argument? Muttering to myself all day long? Accusing other people? Wondering what, if I continue with these studies, what it's going to rob me of? I'll tell you something. I've got good news for you. Oh, tremendous. See, the trouble is you, you haven't gone far enough to know how great this is. God, truth, reality, capital R, never robs you of anything that is right. But you, you, we don't know what right is, and so we're worried, see, of anything right. You can even have all the right, right everyday pleasures. Maybe that's where you're afraid of. It's going to rob you of something in everyday pleasures. What? Find out. Truth never robs us of anything we really need, which is not a religious statement, but a fact. I'll tell you something else. What you need, and what I need, may be totally different things. We are indeed individuals physically, psychologically. Totally different. I don't have to be interested in what you're interested in and vice versa. The path can be somewhat different for each individual, or the influences are, are different from each, uh, for each individual. The past can be different. The path. I've got Sorry. Um, the path. 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 All right. All right. See. All right. All right. Obviously, there is only one path, one way to truth. That's that's no problem there. But I've been conditioned totally different than you have. Huh? I know what my conditioning is. A lot of it was was religion and I had to get rid of that nonsense which is very difficult very hard because the threats were built into me just like they were built into you the threats the devil always threatens write that down then you'll never forget it the devil always threatens whether it's another human being or inside yourself My conditioning may be stronger in some areas. I may have, for example, Ruth, I may have a, a lot of different false guilts that don't bother you. See? Okay. Things like that. So we have different oh, yes, yes, sure. So this is why it has to be individual work, different emphasis. But there are other things that are very, very fundamental, too. For example, 
self-initiative. Self-initiative. When I get up in the morning, no one's going to tell me to, to watch your steps as you walk from the bedroom into the kitchen or wherever you go. No one's going to tell me to, to feel the weight of my body on the floor as it pushes against the floor as I walk across the room. I have to do that for myself. I have to become conscious of my own physical body. Let me summarize. Let, let's say that we are indeed in different states at different times. Sometimes we're very serious, very serious. Sometimes in this group we're very lighthearted. Some of you in this room, and now we get to it, some of you in this room are terrified of having a sense of humor. Do you know why? You think it's weakness. I know. You think it's weakness. What? Well, well, I've, I've got to find God before I die. And, you, <laughs> and you're wasting my time laughing? <coughs> Who are you? It's very, very simple, really. When you see that you don't exist as you thought you did, why not laugh? You see, I have serious attitudes toward me because I think I exist. I don't exist that way at all, which does not mean stupidity or frivolousness at the wrong time. There's the right time to be lighthearted, too. And sometimes it's before the class, and sometimes it happens naturally right in the class. Uh, Ruth, uh, yes. I have another question. Is there not a right time to cry? Not to feel sorry for yourself, but when you feel that it's advantageous to really it out. <coughs> to cry, did you say? Yeah. Not feeling sorry for yourself, but really giving in and just having a good call. Why do you cry? The emotional outlet. Because you can't help it? No, no. You could help not. yourself? No. No, I'm not feeling sorry for myself or something I can't help. It's, it's, um, it's not like a purging or a recognition. As a work project, you will never cry again in your life. Why? Explain to me, please. You enjoy crying? No. No, but it's very helpful. <laughs> 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 yeah, come to think of it, there is... What is your state when you're crying? Have you ever watched your state while you're crying? Yes. What's it like? Describe it to us. You mean you're condemning yourself for your no, foolishness? No, no, it's different. No. <laughs> really. Okay. Uh, Lillian and then Larry. Maybe they will maybe they'll comment, maybe they won't. Let's see what happens. Okay. Go ahead, Lillian. <clears throat> this statement the devil always threatens. Uh, this week thought or the devil has been attacking with such ferociousness it's has almost seemed like a, a true thing, a separate enmity. I don't know if I can explain it. Just so overpowering, as though it really were something to be afraid of. Are you talking personally? Yes. All right. All right. Or were you through, Lily? Yes. Yeah, fine. All right, Larry, go ahead. Then I'll have a comment to make. Go ahead, Larry. <laughs> On an absolute body physical level, there's a small tear duct inside of the eye that when it secretes a lubricant, it flushes the eye. Laughter opens that tear duct. Sinus, this thing blocks it. Hmm. A lesson in medical physiology or something, right? All right. All right. 
I will tell you something again. I'll tell you something. Lillian, uh, Ruth, anybody, I'm speaking personally of me now, not my condition, me at all. I'm not bluffed. I'm not frightened. I'm not threatened. By your state, by your state, by Rudy's state, by Lorraine's state, by Leland's state today, I'm not bluffed by that. I'm not scared by it. Why are you scared of it? I'm telling you that you are giving it power yourself. You are giving it power. I'm not going to give it one inch of power. Not in this classroom or anywhere else. Aren't you glad? Because if I can not take it seriously because I see through it, then you don't have to take it seriously. If you take it seriously at first with the intention of understanding it, you will never again in your life take the devil seriously. Have you ever seen a ghost movie, a monster movie on television? Huh? Did you take those monsters seriously? Huh? Were you scared? Well, some of you would. Did you take those monsters seriously? That's what we're talking about. I know that they that out in Hollywood they get a camera and they start turning it and the actor actor who put on a big uh, monster mask came out on the stage and he went by like that like that like that and then he went off and everybody went home and they had the, the film film made that's just a film it's a film you are running mental movies through your mind connected with emotion and they seem so real to you and that is very egotistical of you and me to do that that's why we're scared Oh, I loved monster movies. Huh? I love to be scared. When I'm sitting in my living room, I... Yeah. <laughs> Connie, what are you doing? You're never going to make it as a monster actor. <laughs> <laughs> last night, for those of you who are new to it this morning, one of our objectives in finding ourselves is to learn to think clearly, to think in a practical way, to think in short, concise, accurate sentence sentences, to not be <laughs> rambling in our minds all day and all night long but to take advantage of the fact that we can indeed change the way we think. We can change the instructions we give to ourselves all day long, and thereby change our actions, change what happens to us, change our life, change our state of emotions, change our level of happiness, if you want to use that word. So we had some examples last night of thinking with right instruction toward ourselves, right instruction toward ourselves. And fortunately for each one of us here in this room, there is a part of us, a very deeply buried part of us, that does indeed know the difference between right and wrong. So that as we work on ourselves, as we deliberately enter tense situations, as we keep ourselves right in the middle of the struggle consciously, and as we give ourselves right instructions, even at the start, not knowing whether it's right or not, but by daring to enter the battle, daring to enter the battle instead of running away from it in daydreams or exciting activities or, or whatever. This part of us that knows the difference between what is right and what is wrong for me personally, for you personally, can be heard by us individually. But we have, to, we have to do the work ourselves. We found out last night, did we not, that I have to take the initiative. It's my life. No one can live my life for me. No one can give me the initiative that I need to start using my mind, this mad mind of ours. No one can 
start instructing me but myself in using it correctly. When I suddenly in a crisis or when the day is apparently calm, I'm working in the kitchen or the office is calm for the moment, I give myself a right instruction. It does so many things for me and you'll be able to list them later on. But for now, let's say that it does indeed not only give me the right thought, but it puts an, an end, it puts a small shock into my mind and puts an end to rambling thought, to wild emotions that I would never have believed were there. But if I give myself the simple instruction, look, I give myself the simple instruction in the, in the middle of the day, this is not a healthy feeling, right? Have you ever caught yourself in an unhealthy feeling knowing that it was unhealthy for you? See what you've done? You've already become aware that you're in a state that is not good for who? For you personally, for me personally. That is right instruction. What we're going to do this morning is take, you can contribute to it if you want, take a number of these short instructive sentences then comment on them, discuss them, take them in a little different way. First, we've got them in our mind, we say them to ourselves, and then if we want, we can comment correctly to ourselves on them. I take the simple statement, the simple statement, the initiative must be mine. Now I can ponder, I can reflect, I can think about it. And it, it becomes obvious from the very start that that dear wife or dear husband or dear friend or dear whoever can't really do a thing for me. Now, I may have known that on the intellectual level, and they've even repeated it, that every man is responsible for himself. But as I, as I begin to think about it and reflect about it, I see I'm the one who has to do it, which in turn leads me to the conclusion that I can't be lazy anymore, which leads me to the conclusion that I have to, I have to enter a new, look, a new kind of struggle with myself. Only this time the struggle has a definite right aim, struggle to wake up and to stop being a slave of my own mad thoughts. Do any of you ever see yourself being a slave of your own mad thoughts, being carried away by your feelings? All right, we're going to put a stop to that, an absolute stop to it. What's the profit of it? Well, the false profit is, as we also have seen, it makes me the center of my own attention for a short while. I can, I can think about myself. And even that is a mistake, because I'm not thinking about myself at all. I'm thinking about the ideas I have about myself. Can you see that simple difference? Do you understand you can't really think about yourself? Because there's no self to think about. But I can call it myself and then think about it. Which is false, because I'm thinking about something that doesn't exist at all. But I like the delusion, I like the illusion that I exist as this or that kind of a person <coughs> simply because I know nothing else. And I'm afraid of what's on the other side of not knowing who I am. Okay, I will give you a beautiful thought to start with and we can comment on it a little bit. Here's a beautiful thought. Beautiful. I need authentic help but don't know what it is and don't know where to find it. I need authentic help, but don't know what it is and don't know where to find it. So there's a part of me that knows what a mess my life is, how my emotions take me over. This part, this part is looking at itself and sees the problem. So I know I need help. No problem so far. That's all right. I need help. You need help. Okay. No problem. When I am without a seeking for this help that I need, when I don't have a source for it, what happens? What happens is that I don't create a false source of help. When I need help, but say, I don't know what it is, not only am I being honest, but I'm no longer deceitfully referring to the false sources of help within myself or outside of myself. 
So I'm left with no answer at all, with no thought at all as to what will help me, help me in this desperation. You know this problem you have at home? This domestic difficulty, this career difficulty? <coughs> If you say, I know what the answer is, it's the answer is to go to college or to leave that person or to get another person. I've given myself an answer, which is no answer at all. So it is beautiful, what I'm saying, of course, it is beautiful to be without an answer, to not know what to do, which puts an end to searching for an answer, which puts an end to false answers, which puts an end to the need to find an answer. <coughs> Follow? Clear? See how beautiful that is? See how different that is? See how, to use the word, how revolutionary that is. And it's about time we found something psychologically revolutionary because the old established ways haven't worked at all. This is a very scary, frightening thing to say. I need, I need authentic help, but don't know what it is. Isn't that scary? No, you don't know it's scary because you've never done it. Because you're still lying to yourself, see? You understand? You're still lying to yourself, and you still, quote marks, know the answers. Do you know the answers, quote marks? Okay, all right. What is your inner condition? What is your inner state? What is my inner state? Am I scared? Am I hostile toward the world? Am I bitter? Am I bitter? You know the answers and yet you're bitter. Look. Pray for the... I hold my hands. Pray for the day when you and I can see a contradiction in what I say to myself and the way I am. The inability to see, to see contradictions in, my, in ourselves <coughs> prevents us from waking up. I refuse to see them. If I know the answers, how come I'm so mentally sick? If I know the answers, how come I have to blab so much to convince you that I do? If I know the answers, how come I'm suppressing all this hostility? Someone, someone is telling a lie, and guess who? So having made the statement, that I want authentic help but don't know what it is or where to seek it, I enter a new fear. The fear of seeing with my feelings. I saw it intellectually before. In fact, I come to this group all the time, perhaps, and say, I want the help of this group. A large part of you doesn't mean it at all. It came in here with all its protections and it will go out with all its protections. I've done something quite remarkable. I've voluntarily, consciously, as much as I can, entered the fearful state of seeing that I've never known the answers, that I don't know them now, and don't know where I'm going to find them. Which will, for the first time in my life, open the door to the answer with a capital A, which is not a part of my protective psychic system or my aggressive psychic system. If I protect, I attack. That's clear, is it not? If I attack, I protect. Protect. If I remain in the state of not knowing the answers, guess what? I've given God truth Reality with a capital R, understanding with a capital U, its first opportunity to change me. So.
so that the right thought I had, the right thought I had that I need help, turns into something completely different. To my great astonishment, I find out that I am my own help, but a new I is, a new self is, a new part of me, a new part of me is the help. It wasn't God that I met in church on Sunday, because that God didn't go with me on Monday. Right? But I have a new God. You can use a capital G if you want. That is nothing else than a part of me. That is nothing else than me itself. The new me. So this essence, this true part of me, is the answer. The answer to even such petty decisions as to how I should behave economically in this world. How do I handle my money in this world? Or how do I respond to a person who challenges me, who demands that I give him an answer? How do I respond to that? I, I, have to take, I don't have to take thought at all. Because something that is totally different from what I used to be is doing the work for me. Ceasing to live from false words and false attitudes. Ceasing to live from it. Something else lives for me. And this is what the effortless life is all about. It all depends on whether I, when I ask the question about where, where can I find the answer, if I cease to grab an answer. If I cease to grab an answer, I will go through the shock of seeing that I never really had one at all, after which I begin to change inwardly. Which is something to experiment with, which is something to experience personally, which is something to be without effort. God does not have to try to be God. Truth is effortless. It is there, it's yours, it's mine. then I can take a deep breath. And if I stray, I catch myself straying, and I put in a, a right thought at that point that we discussed last night, and that will get me back on the right track, the beginning of the right track. And so I, I recall myself back from the detour, back to the main highway, perhaps 50 or 100 times a day. And boy, I'll tell you, then am I glad, then are you glad at the absence of tense self-defense. I will be glad at the absence of tense self-defense. Do you defend yourself? Okay, another thought. We're commenting on We'll have comment after. So I just want to repeat that. I, I missed that. I will be uh, glad to be absent of. Oh, uh -huh. I will be glad at the absence of tense self-defense. I will be glad at the absence of tense self-defense. Because there's nothing left to defend. <laughs> only, only falsehood needs to be defended. Correct? Only falsehood needs to be defended. So if I'm in tense self-defense, I'd better look and see what I'm defending. Statement. Right statement. A false teaching is one that says I can change my life without changing myself. A false teaching is one that says I can change my life without changing myself. Any problem there? Clear? quite clear. Statement. My circumstance is right when I am right, for I am my circumstance. My circumstance is right when I am right, 
because I am my circumstance. I said, when I am right, is there any circumstance for me outside of myself? Not really. Not really. I am my own circumstance. See, see how this connects? How many of you work in a place which is pretty hustly and bustly at times? How many of you live in a home which is pretty madhouse at times? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't dare see it. This, this other person, this boss, or this person who lives in the home with you, they have a problem, do they? The boss has a problem, the employee at the desk next, next to you, the customer has a problem. I'm trying to figure out why you and I are on the same level as that crab. so that he or she can make me crabby. See, he or she is a crab. Well, there must be something wrong with me because he or she can affect me, can influence me. Therefore, I see that the crabby individual circumstance becomes my circumstance. I'm gullible, I'm easily influenced, I'm on the level of the crab. What would happen if I worked real hard on myself and became my own right, pure circumstance? Then I could be in that office with a bunch of crabby people. Of course, I'm nice, they're crabby, we understand that. <laughs> and I could be in that office with all these unnice people <coughs> If I was right within myself, then there'd be no correspondence between their negative nature and mine. So my circumstance would always be right because I am right. How many have heard this before, what I just said? May I see your hand? How many have heard this before? Huh? How many uh, live it? See, uh, one thing I have to keep harping on here is your unconscious assumption, your unconscious statement, I have heard that before. When you're living it, instead of unconsciously saying, I have heard that before, you will say, how wonderful, how tremendous, how beautiful. Do you, do you know what's the most exciting thing in this group? The most exciting thing for you as an individual sitting here, hearing something that is right, that is true, and being excited, thrilled, uplifted by knowing it is true from personal experience. That is your rightness, to use a figure of speech now, that is your essence talking to itself, so to speak. It doesn't really talk to yourself. God does not talk to himself. The thrill, I wish there was another word, inspiration, the inspiration of knowing, capital O, oneness. A truth is stated, a truth is felt in this class. And because one small part of you has lived it, who understands it, you respond, you vibrate, you are inspired by feeling the oneness of it. And when you feel this rightness, there is no thought. There's no reaction at all on the level of thinking, of idea to what I say. If there was thought you would ruin it all. We have had occasions when people have come to this group who are not ready for this, who wanted to challenge, who wanted to argue. That is because the truth was too much for them, and so they responded with thought. Or, or they agreed. They could hardly wait to agree with me. 
which again ruined it. <clears throat> Summary, and then we'll take a short break, and then we'll have open discussion. During the entire day, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, as long as I'm not doing something that's physically dangerous, driving the car or something like that, I'm going to catch myself right in the middle of action, physical action, whatever it might be, and see what actual state I'm in. And if I'm being carried away, and you are being carried away all day long, put an end to it and put in its place a simple right thought. A simple right thought simple right thought I don't have to be carried away like this anymore that's a right thought you are you're not doing it yet you are being carried away this is the first step we call it a the foundation the first brick to building the cosmic castle last night that's what we call it now I'll give you a right thought for the rest of the meeting which is this each time I speak in this class or think something, I will look to see what I am saying or thinking. I will listen to what I say. That's all. All of us in this room have certain ideas about the kind of a person you are. I have ideas perhaps about the kind of a person I am. Rudy has ideas about the kind of a person he is. Is that correct, Rudy? You all have ideas about the kind of a human being you are. Are you aware of that or not? If you're not even aware of that, then forget it. Then we have to go back further. Are you aware that you have ideas of about the kind of a person you are? May I select someone? Let's see. Uh, we'll take Connie. She's always a good example. Connie, do you think... A nice neutral example. Do you think... You, you, you have ideas about yourself? Yeah. Okay. Do you think that um, Leland sees you in the same way you see yourself? No. Lillian, do you think Juan sees you in the same way you see yourself? Careful. Let's see. Ted, do you think uh, Rudy sees you in the same way you see yourself? Have you ever been embarrassed by someone seeing you in a way you didn't, you, 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 which you saw yourself a different way? Huh? Ever been embarrassed? Huh? If during the rest of the meeting we can be aware of ourselves talking, thinking, gesturing, if I can watch myself as I'm talking to the group, asking a question, if I can have my attention back on myself as well as the talking itself, I can begin to see myself and maybe all of a sudden, wow, I'll see that many sees me in a different way than, than I am seeing myself. Which is healthy shock. I don't want to see it. Who said I want to see it? Because I'm nice. And all of a sudden I see that even my question is asked in a wrong spirit. The question is asked in a wrong spirit. And for the first time I notice this and, and I look at Fred's expression and I see a very wise expression, and he's seeing through me. How do I know he's seeing through me? I've seen through myself. I want to drop through the floor, right? This is the embarrassment I'm going to deliberately and consciously put myself through. Because I am sick and tired of being the kind of a human being I am. If I do this one thing, I can begin to change. If I don't, I won't change. Now I have to make up my mind which I want. You have to make up your mind which you want.
Do you really think other people see you as you see yourself? Do you really think so? <clears throat> I'm nice, everybody must think I'm nice, huh? What do you suppose people say about us behind our backs? Pretty shocking, huh, Joan? Huh? Huh? This can be pretty rough. And that's why we're here. Very, very seriously, this is why we're here. It is that or walk out of here to the same hell. Make up your mind. Okay, break time. Other people do not, and underline not, other people do not see me as I see myself. Other people do not see me as I see myself. Now isn't that something to work on, to connect with everything else we've talked about? So we'll have open discussion now, and you're going to uh, watch yourself talk. You're going to notice the tone of your voice. You're going to notice whether there's any nervousness in your comment. Now, I hope this doesn't make you so self-conscious that you don't say, that you remain silent. Because now, if you talk, ask a question, or make a comment, that would be Daniel consciously entering the lion's den, right? Okay, we're in open discussion now. If you have a short, clear, accurate, right, good, guiding thought for us, give that to us. There's something that you have said to us that meant a great deal more to me this week. Nothing bad will happen to you as a result of going to be this week. Yeah. Uh, in line with this idea that other people do not see us as we see ourselves, uh, it's interesting to become aware of how in our own imaginations we project upon other people what we think they are, and they're not that way at all. That's right. Yeah. Uh, this is a shock, because yeah. Uh, yeah. we want people to act in a certain way, and we imagine it. Julian and I were just talking about that. Right. Are there any nice people in the world? From the higher viewpoint, there are no nice people at all. What is society's judgment of nice people? Did you ever hear anything bad said about someone at a funeral? He would always had an open pocketbook and an open heart to all his friends. Right? The man was a sick neurotic. And that little one is a redundant phrase, sick neurotic. So you're protecting yourself from being shocked. So you'll stay exactly as you are. And you will die exactly as you are. Are you aware that you're protecting yourself? Hmm? When you get insulted, I get insulted, I'm protecting myself. Right? I feel insulted at the way you treated me. I feel bad, so I'm protecting the idea I have of how you should treat me. I call all this, I call all these teachings threatening, I call them that, and so I have to react to them as if they are threatening. What if I had silence toward the te these teachings? Would they be a threat? Or would they be beautiful? They would be beautiful. After I passed through the shock, the jungle.
They were beautiful all along, but I didn't know that because I was calling them something else. I was calling them a threat to my, how about this? Uh, they are a threat to my self-esteem, a threat to my sense of self-worth. Do any of you have a strong sense of self-worth? Huh? That's your problem. That's my problem. You will all, right this instant, recover and start new right now. Drop one second ago and start new right now. Now see, we're fresh. There's nothing, there's nothing but freedom right now. That thought, well, that was negative a minute ago, where is it? It's gone. I'm fresh right now. interrupt it I have to interrupt the state don't I and how can I interrupt it if I don't know it's there and how can I know it's there unless I, unless I look at it what state are you in right now emotionally for example take emotions what emotional state are you in am I in right now that's the important thing without making any judgment without making any judgment it makes no look it makes no difference whatever what the state is it makes no difference what it is. Whether it's depressed or falsely excited. Because when I judge the state, I keep it going. Now, I mustn't judge the state. I must drop it right now. Put an end to it. Now I'm fresh. Don't you know that you were, you were eternally fresh? Right now, in this class, there's no past history at all. You don't have any past history at all, nor any future. You can't write a biography of God or a history of God. Probably imagination, yeah. You said it on the level of thought, and the, since this is all we know is thinking, we think this is the, the state, see? We think the thought is the state. The thought can never be the state, because the state includes every part of me, every part of me. It includes my emotions, includes my physical body, includes my sex center, includes all parts of me. I'm, you know, look, I'm either out of jail or I'm in jail, right? I'm either out or in of it, in it. If I'm in jail thinking I'm out, I'm in. But I, it is proper to think how I'm going to get out of this jail. Rusty. I think I have a question. Being you, I'm sure you've discussed this before and I'm not aware of it. Nice and loud, please. Okay. Uh, when you're saying that you can't be insulted, 
therefore you, you know you can't be hurt etc et yeah. what are the commandments you give yourself because right away you do feel it uh -huh. all, all right all right you could i'll tell you what to do and you'll understand this when you feel insulted ask yourself who is being insulted correct who is being insulted you won't know you won't know because you, you don't understand that you've been calling yourself by all these labels, names, ideas all your life. You won't know, but you're on the right track. You're starting, you're starting to question the you who gets insulted. Who is the you who gets insulted? It's non-existent in reality. It exists only in imagination, right? Look, take, look. can you find some simple example of where you feel insulted and then find out what thought what idea, what stand, what conviction you had felt insulted. Not you at all. The essence can't be insulted at all because it has no demands at all. It, it, it doesn't ask to be treated in a certain way at all. Now, I know how frightening this is to drop your demands for being treated in a certain way, but this keeps us in fear. Why don't you, why don't you find out what it means to live with no demands at all to a society, to anyone, except on the physical level, because then you need food. Why should anyone treat you why, in a certain way? How many of you want someone to be loyal to you? Someone wants to? Why should they be loyal to you? Huh? Because you're nuts, yes. Because you're nuts. How many, of you, how many of you would get furious if someone was disloyal to you? Did I see your hand, Fred? I'm watching all this, see? <laughs> yes, stop it. That's right, that's right. The reason we give things to other people is so we can say, now you owe me, now I've got you. Now I've got you. Well, on this insulting business, uh, if you see that somebody can insult you, well, you're doing it to them first. Sure you are. You're just getting back. Sure you are. The same level is operating. You notice the false pleasure in feeling insulted? You get your, if you don't like insult, get another one. Hurt your feelings. You notice the false pleasure in getting your feelings hurt? In crying? In feeling sorry for yourself? And I will add this. If any of you want to weep tears of joy, <laughs> you're quite welcome to do so, but leave me out. Again. Find out. <laughs> I think we've got something coming here. <laughs> now, as we're generally aware, um, the basis of all mechanical religion is some kind of orthodoxy. That is, some kind of opinion or point of view which is the accepted norm for the group. Now, in my own experience, I have never seen such a thing, that is such a <coughs> standard of behavior, which was not self-contradictory. And the comment that I was going to make at the close of the meeting last night was simply to observe <coughs> the effect in the group of just exactly what happened. The idea that, you know, if I have cried in the past, I no longer cry, and therefore I'm on with things. And now I'm right, whereas before I was wrong. Okay. You know, <laughs> or it feels right to do this, but the standard is to do this, so I do this. And so we're just open to self-deception 
up one side and all the way down the other. At the close of the meeting, <clears throat> the little conversation between Rod and Ruth, I, I didn't get it all, but I could certainly see that Ruth was attempting to defend her position, to justify her behavior. Okay. Okay. I made a statement that was seemingly contrary to the authorized point of view, which immediately brought great guffaws on all sides, as if there can be no other opinion. That's simply an observation. All right, fine. 